Hello, welcome to today's course. This is Geriatric Considerations with COVID-19. My name is Suzanne Greenwall and I'll be your speaker. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I'm a physical therapist and I have about 18 years of practice. I have worked primarily in the area of geriatrics with a focus on cardiopulmonary conditions. I'm also an assistant professor at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee and I'm the secretary for the cardiovascular and pulmonary section of the APTA. Let's go ahead and start today by going over our course objectives. So by the end of the course, I hope that you will be able to describe why older adults have an increased risk of contracting COVID-19. I want you to be able to describe the expected post-acute presentation of an older adult who has been hospitalized with COVID-19 discuss exercise prescription for older adults in the post-acute phase of COVID-19, and be able to describe two negative side effects of social isolation for older adults. So let's go ahead and jump right in by talking about some COVID-19 and older adult facts. Ever since COVID-19 um, appeared and became a pandemic here in the United States. There's been a lot of facts um, going around about this disease. And so what I want to do is really highlight and talk about the ones that are pertinent to the older adult population. So older adults are more likely to develop COVID-19 and they are also more likely to develop complications from it. In fact, eight out of 10 of the coronavirus deaths that have been reported in the United States have been an adult 65 years old and older. And among adults with confirmed COVID-19 in the United States, we're seeing that the older adults have increased hospitalization rates and increased rates of admission to intensive care units. So looking specifically at the numbers regarding hospitalization, when you look at the age range of 65 to 84 years of age, the percentage of those requiring hospitalization is 31 to 59 percent. But then once you look at the age range of 85 and older, we're looking at 31 to 70 percent. So you'll see that there's a lot of similarities there um, in those percentages of requiring hospitalization, but overall that that percentage does go up as age increases. And then when we look specifically at the percentage of individuals that require admission to an intensive care unit, the rates are six to 29% in adults 85 years old and older, and 11 to 31% and those that are 65 to 84. So interestingly, not a lot of difference there in those numbers. When we look at deaths associated with COVID-19, there is an increased uh, risk of death with older adults. So in those 85 and older, the percentage is 10 to 27% of those that have died from this here in the United States, and then four to 11% in those 65 to 84. So overall, what we're seeing is that Older adults have an increased risk of contracting COVID-19, and they also have an increased risk of it becoming more medically severe. So what we also see with COVID-19 is that some individuals will develop severe illness from it and others will not. So one of the big questions then is who is at risk for severe COVID-19 illness? You know, why are we seeing that some people get so sick from it where others get it and don't even know they have it. So when we talk about those that are at increased risk for this severe COVID-19, those that we're really talking about are individuals that are 65 years of age and older, those that reside in nursing homes or assisted living facilities, and then people of all ages are at an increased risk if they have certain underlying medical conditions. And that risk for severe illness becomes even higher in those patients if those medical conditions are not well controlled. So what are these medical conditions that I'm talking about? These include things like chronic lung disease, moderate and severe asthma, 
we're also talking about immunocompromised patients. So individuals who have HIV or AIDS, individuals undergoing cancer treatment, those that smoke or have a history of smoking, individuals with immune deficiencies, individuals who have prolonged use of corticosteroids, or those that are status post bone marrow or organ transplants. So all of those individuals would be considered immunocompromised, which places that at an increased risk for a more severe COVID-19 condition. Other conditions that increase one's risk is severe obesity, which is defined as a BMI of greater than 40, individuals with chronic kidney disease and those undergoing dialysis, those with diabetes and liver disease. So what we see is that these chronic diseases that I just mentioned, they increase one's risk of COVID-19 at any age. However, we see that the chronic disease risk increases with aging. So the risk of having those chronic diseases increases as you age. So our older adults are already at a greater risk for severe COVID-19 illness. And then that becomes compounded even further by the presence of chronic diseases. Another thing that we're seeing with COVID-19 patients is that age and the presence of comorbidities are the greatest predictors of survival. So what that means is older adults who have more comorbidities or more of these chronic conditions, that is going to negatively impact them with regards to this illness. So let's talk specifically about aging. Why are older adults, what is going on with older adults that makes them at an increased risk? You know, we just mentioned all these chronic conditions, but outside of that, what is really going on? Why are older adults at an increased risk? So some questions to think about. You know, why does COVID-19 create more severe illness in older adults? Outside of the presence of chronic diseases, are other things occurring in older adults that increase their risk? And why is hospitalization, ICU admissions, and death more common in older adults? So what we see is that with aging, there are many changes that occur in the pulmonary system. And we should consider, like, do these changes ultimately impact how an older adult responds to a pulmonary condition like COVID-19? You know, the aging process that occurs in the pulmonary system is slow. It occurs over time, but changes really aren't felt functionally until the sixth or seventh decade of life. But we can see that the aging process in the pulmonary system is exacerbated or complicated by other factors. So things like pollution, occupational exposures, inhaled drugs, cigarette smoking can all affect the aging process. Some of the specific changes that we see in the pulmonary system with aging include that the compliance of the lungs decreases. This essentially means the ease with which the lungs inflates decreases. Okay, so there's more resistance. We see that vital capacity decreases. So that maximum volume expired after a maximum inspiration. Essentially how much air an individual is moving decreases with aging. The peripheral chemoreceptors are not as responsive to hypoxemia, and the central receptors are not as responsive to hypercapnia. So the body does not respond to those changes in O2 levels as quickly and is able to maintain that baseline or status quo level as easily. The overall ventilatory response that's mediated by the central nervous system is significantly depressed in older adults. We also see structural changes with aging, specifically in the thorax. Calcification of the ribs occurs. There's also calcification of the costal cartilage. There's arthritic changes that occur in the joints of the ribs and the vertebrae. There's an increase in thoracic kyphosis and an increase in the anterior to posterior chest diameter. So what's the significance of all of those changes? You know, specifically these ones that I just mentioned in the structure of the thorax. 
essentially what those all are going to contribute to is that the chest wall is going to become less compliant. And if there's less compliance in the chest wall, that means that individuals are going to have to work even harder to breathe. And so keep in mind what we're talking about right now is normal aging. This isn't in the presence of pulmonary conditions such as COVID-19. So with aging, older adults have to work harder to breathe because of all these changes that naturally occur. There are some other changes I want to mention as well. With aging, the strength and the endurance of the inspiratory muscles decreases, which makes sense. You know, we see that throughout the skeletal muscles of the body. That results in a decreased maximum ventilatory effort. The surface area of the alveoli decreases, which means there's less area for gas exchange to occur. The elastic recoil of the alveoli decreases. And overall, the lungs don't empty as well. So we see that residual volumes increase and the dynamic volumes decrease. And essentially what that means is that more air is staying in the lungs after each breath and we're not moving as much air as we normally would. So there's also changes that occur with aging that are going to cause a decrease in the diameter of the conducting tubules, which are going to cause an increase in resistance to gas flow. So what we see here is that there's calcification that occurs in the tracheal rings, and there's an, also an increase that occurs in the thickness of the mucus. So as the mucus gets thicker and that calcification that occurs in those tracheal rings, that essentially is going to reduce the diameter of the conducting tubules, making it harder for individuals to move air. This is going to create a resistance to gas flow. So the overall result of changes to the respiratory system with normal aging is that older adults have a decreased efficiency of gas exchange and increased work of breathing. And the key word there is with normal aging. So again, we're really talking about what happens just normally with older adults. So now let's tie this into COVID-19. You know, what's the link? How does this all tie together? So the normal changes that occur in the respiratory system with aging cause a decrease in airway and respiratory function, which means there's less ability for the body to compensate and manage with the condition such as COVID-19, because COVID-19 is a respiratory condition. There are also immune system responses that change with aging, which can set up an older adult for more long-term complications from COVID-19. So let's talk now about what is that clinical presentation and how do we really assess and treat this in the post-acute setting in older adults? Where do we go once these individuals you know, are no longer in the hospital? So let's review a little bit here. What do we know about COVID-19? So we know that COVID-19 causes similar onset as other pneumonias where the most common complaint is shortness of breath and inability to breathe. So individuals that present with COVID-19, the most common sy symptoms consistently have been a dry cough and fever. Fatigue is also common. And again, as I mentioned above there, the shortness of breath is also very common. So I mentioned there that it has a similar onset to pneumonia. And so it's important for us to say here that the onset is similar, but it is important that you understand that COVID-19 is not pneumonia. Typical pneumonia is an inflammatory process in the tissue of the lungs. Pneumonia is often unilateral and due to an infectious process. And that is not what we're seeing with COVID-19. If you look at the films or the pictures, the radiology um, findings with COVID-19, what we're seeing is that there's a ground glass opacity and bilateral patchy shadowing. So this is affecting the lung tissue bilaterally, unlike pneumonia, which is typically unilaterally. And what we're seeing is that COVID-19 presents more like an acute respiratory distress syndrome 
because it has actually gotten into the bloodstream. And so the infiltrates that we see in the lung tissue are due to leakiness from the capillaries, not secretions in the lungs themselves. So these capillaries, of course, surround all of our alveoli. And so what happens is with COVID-19, all of our alveoli are affected. So the capillaries become infected because this is in the bloodstream. Those capillaries surround the alveoli and now all of our alveoli are gonna be impacted. And that's why you've probably heard that prone positioning is very important in COVID-19 patients. And that's because more of the alveoli are located posterior. So when you place the patient in the prone position, it can help relieve some of the challenges that are occurring because of those infiltrates. So severe disease onset might result in death because of that massive alveolar damage that can occur and the progressive respiratory failure that can occur. So because COVID-19 has such an impact on the alveoli and the lung tissue, we see that that damage that can occur in the alveoli is really then what can lead to respiratory failure and ultimately could lead to As we've mentioned, there is a huge correlation with age. Um, so patients with severe COVID disease are older than those with non-severe disease. There's been some various studies already looking at this, um, by, but some of the studies have shown about a median of seven years. And then just to highlight again, the presence of any coexisting illness was more common among patients with severe disease than those with non-severe. So again, there's that huge link between developing severe COVID-19 disease if you have a coexisting illness or COVID-19. So I've mentioned several times here, COVID-19 severe disease, and then COVID-19, you know, without using that term severe disease. So I do wanna differentiate the two here with symptoms. So COVID-19 symptoms in general are gonna be your dry cough, fever, fatigue, and shortness of breath. Less common symptoms that are seen is headache, sore throat, congestion, chills, nausea and vomiting, and diarrhea. But when an individual develops severe COVID-19 disease, the symptoms can change a bit. We will see things such as high fever, hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood, a decreased white blood cell count, kidney dysfunction, and there can be multi-organ involvement. So there is a very big difference here in the symptoms. So those that have been hospitalized with COVID-19 typically have dealt with severe COVID-19. And in that acute setting, the treatment for those individuals includes many of the following. It could be things such as antibiotics, ventilation, prone positioning, you know, I mentioned that already, that that is a, a treatment intervention that's being used, but that is being done 12 to 18 hours a day for ventilated and non-ventilated patients. In some situations, ECMO is being utilized, and there's been some really good outcomes with patients who have utilized ECMO. And it's also to important to note that in the acute setting, therapy services may have only occurred minimally and conservatively. And really, we're only seeing them being utilized in those severe COVID-19 patients if severe mobility deficits were identified. And even then, the use of therapy services is pretty minimal. So I also wanna mention airway clearance techniques. If we're talking about a pulmonary condition, and I mentioned that there's infiltrates, you know, it leads to the question of, should we be doing airway clearance with these individuals? So with acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is how COVID-19 presents, airway clearance techniques in general are contraindicated. So that's gonna include things like percussion, vibration, and active cycle of breathing. However, it's important to note that if a COVID-19 patient has pre-existing conditions, such as cystic fibrosis, asthma, COPD, then airway clearance techniques may be helpful and utilized in those individuals. You could also use positive expiratory pressure devices and for those individuals and it can be very beneficial.
So essentially the takeaway there with the airway clearance techniques is if the patient has an underlying condition that we would normally treat with airway clearance techniques, then it is appropriate to consider using airway clearance techniques still for those individuals, even in the presence of COVID-19. However, in individuals that do not have those pre-existing pulmonary conditions that would require the use of airway clearance techniques, then in general, they are going to be contraindicated. So how does this course, how does the course of this disease really play out? You know, COVID-19, it's not a condition similar to the flu or pneumonia that's going to just clear up and be done in seven to 10 days. COVID-19 patients will present post-acutely as individuals who are suffering from a chronic condition. So you're going to expect to see things like they have a decrease in their physiological reserve and their functional activity performance is going to be significantly impaired. Keep in mind, when we talk about functional activity performance, if you are seeing someone in a post-acute setting, while they were in the acute setting, they may have been ventilated, they may have been on ECMO, they may have been in a prone position, you know, more than 12 hours a day, they may have been receiving minimal therapy or mobility services, so these patients are going to be very de deconditioned and debilitated. When a patient has been hospitalized for COVID-19, the patient can develop a lot of things. And some of what we're seeing is isolation psychosis, delirium, dyspnea or shortness of breath, fatigue, pain, muscle wasting, low endurance, and an increased incidence of depression. So as healthcare providers, when we start working with these individuals in the post-acute setting, we really want to be watching for all of these things. Patients may also present with post-intensive care syndrome or PICS. PICS is made up of health problems that remain after the critical illness. So once a patient is no longer in the ICU setting, these are health problems that can continue and that we need to be aware of. Say, so they're, they're present when the patient is in the ICU, but then they can persist after the patient leaves that acute setting. And these are problems that involve the patient's body, thoughts, feelings, and mind, and can also have a big impact on the families. So PICS may show up uh, with things like muscle weakness, which is also known as ICU acquired weakness. Individuals may present with problems with thinking, memory, attention and judgment, and other mental health problems. So again, so many of the patients that are in the acute setting for COVID-19 are there because they had severe COVID-19 illness. So then as they start to leave the hospital setting and they're now being seen for therapy services and in post-acute settings, whether that's skilled nursing facilities or home health setting, we need to be aware of syndromes such as PICS and the result that that can have on our patients. I mentioned ICU acquired weakness. Um, you know, what we're seeing is that there's an increase in survivor survivors of all critical illnesses. You know, our medical care has become so much more advanced that individuals survive critical illnesses today that weren't survived decades ago. However, what we see though is that many survivors experience years of disability and impairments in both physical and cognitive function. And in COVID-19 individuals are at risk for ICU acquired weakness. So we want to be monitoring our patients for things such as muscle weakness, neuropathy, myopathy, and atrophy. Those are all going to be very common. And as you see that list there, you know, weakness, neuropathy, myopathy, atrophy, you know, I hope you all are thinking that that's really going to also impact function because those are all key components to our ability to use our musculoskeletal system so that we can have normal functional mobility. 
We also see that ICU acquired weakness is associated with longer durations of hospitalizations and mechanical ventilation. So the longer someone is hospitalized and the longer someone is receiving mechanical ventilation, there is an increased risk of ICU acquired weakness. So some of your severe COVID-19 patients who had prolonged ICU stays, who had prolonged time on a ventilator, are going to have an increased risk for this. So as you start to assess patients in the post-acute setting, some things to consider. Certainly strength assessment is going to be huge. You know, and for all the reasons that I just mentioned, you want to be considering the effects of atrophy, of ICU acquired weakness, of that prolonged immobility. Your strength is going to be greatly impacted. Mobility assessment is going to be huge as well, and that is going to be a key thing that we're going to need to do with all these patients. We also need to be aware that these patients are going to be at an increased fall risk, so that's something else we're going to need to assess for. As you can imagine, endurance will be restricted. You can consider using things like rate of perceived exertion scales and other standardized um, assessment tools or outcome measures to look at endurance. The respiratory assessment is going to be important. You want to be monitoring for shortness of breath, monitoring vital signs, paying attention for a cough. Neurological assessment is another key component. You know, we just mentioned that neuropathy is very common in these individuals who've had the prolonged hospital stays and ICU admissions. So we want to assess for neuropathy. Certainly, if these individuals have neuropathy, we want to be aware because that's going to impact their mobility, their safety, their balance, their overall functioning. We also need to have a way to screen these patients for depression and cognitive deficits. Pain needs to be monitored, and ADLs will typically be impaired. So again, all of these areas need to be assessed very thoroughly so that we can really determine what is the magnitude of these patients' deficits. I mentioned outcome measures. So if you're wondering like, what kind of outcome measures would be appropriate for these individuals, Certainly, as, as you all know, it really depends on what the patient's level of function is at evaluation or when you could initiate in some of these outcome measures. The six-minute walk test is always a fantastic outcome measure to use with pulmonary patients. A lot of these patients may not be able to tolerate that upon evaluation, you know, upon that initial evaluation in the post-acute setting, but that would be a great goal to work up towards. There are many different seated and standing step tests, which would also be very appropriate tools to use. Those are great ways to, to assess cardiopulmonary capacity and endurance. The timed up and go would be beneficial. That one does not take a lot of time, but it gives us that quick look at a lot of aspects of mobility with regards to sit to stand, ambulation, being able to turn. So we're also getting that balance component. Assessing gait speed is also going to be a, a, a key tool to use with these individuals because as you can imagine that's going to be significantly declined um, which certainly has a lot of implications then for safety and overall functioning. And this list here is not all conclusive. These are just some suggestions um, of great outcome measures to start to utilize in the post-acute So in the post-acute settings, long-term reconditioning and strength training is going to be essential. You know, as I've mentioned a couple times here already, these patients really are quite deconditioned and we can expect to see a lot of weakness. Um, their mobilization has been greatly restricted, and so mobility really needs to be our priority. The more we can get these individuals up and moving, the better. So other treatment considerations, you know, we, we mentioned airway clearance techniques uh, specifically associated with in the acute setting, but really the rules apply in that post-acute setting as well. Um, if your patient still is, um, you know, positive for COVID-19, then you're certainly going to follow those restrictions. You know, and one of the, the rationales too with 
COVID-19 and not utilizing traditional airway clearance techniques is the idea that as you're trying, you know, as we do airway clearance techniques, the goal is for the patient to expel secretions and to cough. And the more we're doing that, we're actually uh, spreading the disease. So once the patient is to a point where they're no longer contagious and they're past that acute phase, um, if they have conditions that warrant airway clearance, then you could consider it at that point. But in general rule of thumb, airway clearance is not going to be the treatment that you're leaning towards for a COVID-19 patient. As we're talking about treatment considerations, certainly want to mention the importance of having an interprofessional approach to these patients' care. You know, in the post-acute setting, um, just like the acute setting, there are going to be a significant number of needs that these patients have. Um, you know, as we've already mentioned here, everything from mobility to ADLs to muscle weakness to psychological and cognitive deficits. Um, so we want to have our whole healthcare team involved here. You know, this is going to be social workers, potentially psychologists, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, nursing, physicians. You know, the list is quite extensive. So as healthcare providers, we need to make sure that we're advocating for our patients. Um, and requesting those consults to other professions as well. Family support and involvement from the families is going to be important. You know, and this is a challenging thing because we're in this time of so social isolation. Um, and most of these patients that you'll be seeing in the post-acute setting, you know, have been hospitalized. They have been really isolated from their family members. Um, so getting families involved can be a challenging thing. But this is where we need to be creative. And take a step back and really think about how can we get the families involved. You know, if if the patient is uh, able to be around some family members, that's wonderful. Um, but depending on the situation, they may not be able to. And so then we need to think about other things such as um, video conferencing with family members, you know, maybe calling them during therapy sessions and letting them be a part of that. Keep in mind too that with all the isolation your patients have been through, that your time and attention is going to be so important to these patients. They will crave your time and attention and these therapy sessions are really going to be key to their recovery, not only physically, but also psychologically. So as we talk about treatment, keep in mind that COVID-19 mimics a chronic lung condition. So as we think about exercise prescription, you really want to think back to pulmonary rehab principles and exercise guidelines for older adults. And then you're going to modify your exercise prescription for these patients based on their symptoms, vital signs, and rate of perceived exertion. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about some of the treatment considerations. Um, these guidelines here are all from ACSM. So again, these are general guidelines for older adults, um, and, and we're certainly looking at it from the approach of a pulmonary patient. But again, I really want to emphasize that each patient will be unique, so that's why your assessment and evaluation is so important, so that you can establish that baseline level of function, but then really let your patient's symptoms and vital signs guide you as to when you can increase your exercise, but even more importantly, when you can decrease or when you need to decrease it. So from an aerobic exercise standpoint, a warm up and cool down period are recommended. The frequency of aerobic exercise for older adults that's recommended is five to seven days a week at a moderate intensity level. And when I say moderate intensity, again, you can use vital signs, level of dyspnea, and rate of perceived exertion to help you determine that. Um, but in general, if you were using a zero to 10 exertion scale, a moderate intensity level of exercise would be a five to six on that scale. So that is a great goal. A lot of your patients will be so deconditioned when you first start working with them, um, no matter what post-acute setting you're in, that you're not going to be able to just jump right in at that moderate intensity level. You may need to start out much lower. So just keep that in mind. But this is a great goal to build up to. Ideally, we really want to start engaging these patients in daily exercise.
so that five to seven days a week, and then build up the intensity as they tolerate. The goal also would be 30 to 60 minutes of um, exercise or activity a day. Again, your patients won't typically start with being able to tolerate that kind of time frame all continuously, so they're going to need rest breaks and it may need to be broken down into shorter increments, you know, even 10 minutes at a time. With that frequency of five to seven days a week, um, depending on the practice setting that you're working in, that can look very different. So if you're working in skilled nursing facilities, you may be able to treat these individuals seven days a week for therapy services. Um, if you're in a home health setting, maybe you're only seeing the patient in their home two or three days a week, but then designing exercises for them to do on those other days when you're not there. Muscle strengthening, of course, is going to be very important. You know, it's one thing that we've uh, mentioned quite a bit in this course is just how much weakness these individuals will typically present with. So from a muscle strengthening standpoint, really strengthening should be done a minimum of two days a week. Keep in mind that is the minimum. So we can do more than that based on the patient's tolerance. Strengthening intensity should be moderate to light. And again, with these individuals who have just come from the acute setting um, after COVID-19 admissions, you're really going to have to start more in that light intensity range. And as far as what that muscle strengthening is going to look like, it could be progressive weight training that's really designed to target their areas of muscle weakness. It may be weight-bearing calisthenic exercises. You know, it can be functional exercises like stair climbing. So you're going to see a lot of variance with muscle strengthening exercises based on what is the patient's baseline level of function, um, as well as you know what is their, their level of strength upon evaluation. A great goal, though, would be to do 8 to 10 exercises involving the major muscle groups and trying to work through those um, you know, a couple times a week. Flexibility exercises will also be important for these patients. Again, a minimum of two days a week is recommended. As you can imagine, the patients that have had prolonged ICU stays, prolonged hospitalizations, are going to present with muscle um, limitations with regards to range of motion. They're going to have tightness. They're going to have some muscle shortening that's occurred. So we really want to assess for that and then also help them with those deficits. Because um, as you all know, when you have tight muscles and limitations in range of motion, that's going to affect functional mobility. So the goal would be to stretch to that point of feeling tightness or slight discomfort. Just like with any other stretching, you want to hold the stretch for 30 to 60 seconds. And then any physical activity that maintains or increases flexibility using slow movements um, is, going to be, is going to be beneficial. And just keep in mind that static stretches rather than um, ballistic movements are what is recommended. So with your COVID-19 patients, it's going to be important that you really look at that whole picture. We want to make sure we're incorporating aerobic training, strength training, and flexibility exercises. And then certainly, you know, overall functional mobility, ADLs, um, are all going to be uh, areas that need a lot of focus as well. So there really is a lot to be done from a therapy perspective with these patients. They are, they are in great need of our services, and we want to make sure that we're really, you know, providing these individuals with what they need. While we're here talking about treatment of patients um, with COVID-19, I think it's you know appropriate for us to briefly review some safety considerations. I'm sure that a lot of you have um, you know already heard all of these, but I do want to just briefly touch upon these. It's always a good review because um, there's certainly a lot of safety factors with COVID-19. So in in inpatient post-acute settings, like in a skilled nursing facility. Um, there may be consideration for having teams. So that would mean that there's designated individuals, designated therapists who treat COVID-19 patients versus the non-COVID-19 patients. So this may mean that there are certain therapists assigned to a hallway where anybody who is COVID-19 positive at that moment in time is residing, whereas other therapists then are working with the non-COVID-19 patients. 
You may also have a team that's designated for those that are recovering from COVID-19. So maybe they're past that um, infectious stage, um, but they are now recovering. And so maybe that will be a different team. Also keep in mind that disinfecting all equipment in between patients is going to be crucial. That's so very important. Um, certainly we can't emphasize enough washing our hands and using hand sanitizer before and after patients and then certainly utilizing proper PPE. And we could, uh, you know, spend a whole course talking about um, PPE and hand washing and disinfecting, uh, but certainly don't want to take our time doing that today, but just want to put this, you know, reminder out there of how important these safety considerations are going to be, you know, as we continue into that post-acute so one of the questions that pops up a lot is when is a patient no longer contagious? And I think this is a great thing for us to talk about briefly here, um, especially as we're talking about patients who have left that acute setting and we're now seeing them, you know, whether in home health or skilled nursing facilities, you know, when are they no longer contagious? And I wish I could give you a definitive answer, um, but the answers aren't definitive in this area, but there are general guidelines. So I will share those. Certainly, if you're working in um, an inpatient post-acute setting, most companies have guidelines that they are following, so you certainly want to check with your employers about what the, the rules are where you are working, but here's just some general guidelines. If a patient was positive for COVID-19 and is now being retested, so it appears that they're through that um, acute phase of it and are doing better, and so now they're being retested, then they are considered no longer contagious once they no longer have a fever, and that's without the use of any medication. Their symptoms have to have improved also, and they've had two negative tests in a row that are at least 24 hours apart. Okay, so if we are in a situation, if you are in a situation where the patient is being retested and they've had two negative tests in a row, at least 24 hours apart, and their symptoms have improved and they no longer have a fever and they're not taking a medic any medication for that, then they would be considered no longer contagious. If a patient tested positive for COVID-19 and was hospitalized for COVID-19, but they're not being retested, then they should be considered contagious for a minimum of 14 days after their symptoms first appeared. However, there are some schools of thought of using PPE even longer than this because this is an area we're not definitive on. And then they should also be at least 72 hours without a fever without the use of medication. So keep in mind that even though some of these patients that you're going to see in the post-acute settings may have had these prolonged hospitalizations, and are past the 14 day mark of when their symptoms first appeared, we may still be taking precautions with some of them. So again, I wish I could give you more definitive answers, but that is the best um, you know, guidelines and recommendations we have at this point in time. So let's now move into our last section of this course. And this is looking at the impact of social distancing in older adults. And I think this is really important for us to talk about here you know, this, this lecture um, that I'm doing with y'all is really emphasizing geriatric considerations with COVID-19. And certainly social distancing aff affects individuals at any age, um, but it really has a huge impact on older adults. So I wanna make sure that we talk about that and also go over some things that as clinicians we can do to help these individuals. So social, social isolation, isolation negatively affects the well-being of older adults. You know, that statement probably doesn't come as a surprise to any of us. Um, it has been correlated with anxiety, depression, panic attacks, and even suicidal ideations. And the negative impacts of social isolation are worse when the isolation is involuntary. So if an older adult is in a skilled nursing facility or long-term care facility and their social isolation has been mandated, you know, they have no control over it, it's not voluntary, then we see that the negative impacts of that isolation are typically worse. Many older adults 
as you all know, also suffer from cognitive impairments. So this can be things like mild cognitive impairment um, or dementia, social isolation and cognitive inactivity are risk factors for developing dementia. So when you're isolated from others and there's not a lot of cognitive stimulation or activity happening, that does increase the risk of cognitive decline such as dementia. Delirium, dementia, and depression are all more prevalent during times of social isolation. Okay, that is a huge statement. Delirium, dementia, and depression are all more prevalent during times of social, social isolation. So it's going to be really key that as healthcare providers, we are really watching our older adult patients for those things, for delirium, dementia, and depression. When we see changes in their cognition or in their mood, we need to make sure that we're following up on that. Whether it's doing screening tools, whether it is requesting consults from other healthcare providers, but we don't want to leave those issues um, not, not addressed. Physical activity is also key in reducing those. So physical activity can reduce delirium, dementia, and depression. So we really want to make sure that as therapists, we're really introducing physical activity to our patients and getting them moving. So group exercise is the preferred method of exercise in individuals that have dementia. You know, there's all sorts of studies out there that show that it increases engagement of individuals with dementia, it increases their mood, there's a lot of benefit to group exercise. However, we're at a point in time right now with social distancing that group exercise really isn't an option. So it's very challenging for our older adult patients. So at this point in time, we're really at this unique situation from a therapy standpoint that it's time for us to create a different patient therapist model. So instead of us standing over our patients and telling them what exercises to do, we really want to be a part of the patient's group, especially those older adults who have cognitive deficits. You know, if we know that group activity helps them to have more engagement and helps to improve their mood, then we need to be part of their group. Okay, so we can sit and do the exercises with the patients. We also can try to still create a group. You know, can we FaceTime our patients' children and grandchildren and ask them to be a part of their exercise sessions? Can we increase their engagement in more unique ways? We also need to make sure that we're evaluating our patients' hydration and nutrition. Social distancing in older adults can lead to de decreased consumption of food and drink. And as you all know, there's significant medical impact and overall health impact when individuals become dehydrated and malnourished. So we really need to be watching that as well. And proper hydration and nutrition are also going to be key factors in healing from COVID-19. So these are things that we really want to be watching for. So it's time for us to get creative with our older adult patients. You know, how can we introduce our patients to non-traditional forms of visitors? Introduce your older adult patients to social media. Maybe we incorporate in therapy sessions helping the patients make cards or write letters and send those to their family members. We can reach out to family members and ask them to send things to the patients. Sending photos getting photos for the patients, creating videos with the patients, encouraging phone calls, making those phone calls during therapy sessions, letting the families be a part of things. All of these things can make a huge impact on our older adult patients and help to minimize that impact of social distancing and social isolation. So it's gonna be really key that we as healthcare providers really think about this impact of social isolation and what it is what it is doing to our older adult patients and we want to see what we can do to help them minimize that impact so we've said that COVID-19 presents like a chronic lung disease you know especially as we move into that post-acute setting Chronic lung diseases in and of themselves are associated with depression and anxiety, just like social isolation is. 
Chronic lung diseases are also associated with poor sleep quality, cognitive decline, physical deconditioning, and a decline in the immune system. And so, social isolation has very similar effects. With social isolation, we see poor sleep quality, impaired executive functions, accelerated cognitive decline, poor cardiovascular function, and impaired immunity. So your COVID-19 patients are going to be experiencing not only those effects of a chronic lung condition, but also those effects of social, social isolation. So we want to, or we need to expect in our patients that we may see depression, physical deconditioning, an impaired immune system, anxiety, and poor sleep quality. All of these things are going to be very prominent in our older adult post-acute COVID patients. So we really need to watch for these things. And that brings us to the end of today's course. Here are your references for this. Thank you so much for attending.